September and October, and uh, I'm anticipating that we're going to get a, a, a large response. It's a very good brochure. It has a lot of good in their dependency on chemicals. They also want to eliminate a lot of the maintenance, the physical maintenance of trimming and hedging and things of that nature. And that specific project that you saw was designed keeping those things in mind, trying to lower all the maintenance as much as possible and uh, definitely lower the, the pesticide use and, and physical maintenance. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we took some video while we were there. Why don't we look at that? Okay. Hi there. We're out at a landscaped home that was landscaped about four years ago using primarily all native. Um, the goal of the homeowners here was to eliminate as much maintenance as possible. They wanted to eliminate having to come out and do a lot of hedging and trimming and use a lot of pesticides. So in designing this home, we took all that into effect and tried to create a landscape that would almost maintain itself. Now, it's almost impossible but you can reach a lot of those goals by really being careful what you pick, the plants you choose and the locations that they're in. For example, in this area here, we tried to incorporate using up as much of the ground space as we can. Originally there was a hedge along the wall and a lot of mulched areas. We wanted to eliminate those mulched areas by putting more landscape cover in, eliminating all the unused resources. And what you see here in front of you, behind are two Serenoas, Serenoa rapins. You have both the silver and the green varieties, both both color variations. Over here we have Jamaican caper. Now this plant right now, it's in fruit. When it's in bloom, it's, it's a beautiful plant. It's covered from basically the very top to the bottom in, in blooms, and it's a great attractor for pollinators. You'll get metallic bees and different species of wasps. You'll get uh, different butterflies. Uh, it's just a great all-around hedge, a great specimen uh, shrub also. You utilize this like you would a gardenia in a landscape. Um, instead of incorporating it, as a, as a true hedge, which you can for this plant, I like using it as just a one specimen planting and then incorporate other material around it. Uh, Evergreen Giant Liriope. This is one of the few exotics I do like to use. It's a great ground cover. It uses no pesticides, no herbicides, or excuse me, uh, fungicides. Uh, never really has any major problems that I know of that I've seen. Every once in a while you might get a problem, but it's a great exotic to use. You'll see over here, and also against this wall over here, we have wild coffee. Florida wild coffee. And this is a great hedge material to utilize in a shady environment. As you notice here, we've got the sun coming out of here to the east and setting in the west. So we've got a lot of shade in these environments right here. So we needed a hedge that could still become full enough and accomplish the goals of being full and dense, but not become real leggy and out of control and always trying to stretch towards the light. Now this, this coffee, as you see, it's very dense. It's pretty thick. We cut it back once a year is all we do. I don't mean cut it back to the ground, we just face it and top it about six inches in, both facing and topping. And this produ produces a lot of new growth and always stays full and dense. But this hedge gets trimmed once a year. Okay, this is the fruit of a, of a wild coffee. This fruit is utilized by a lot of different species of birds. Mockingbirds, um, blue jays, uh, a lot of different species of birds will come in and use this. Also, when it's in bloom, you'll see a lot of different butterflies sometimes attracted to it um, and pollinators. The coffee is just a great... Uh, attractor of a lot of different species of wildlife, and again, especially birds. And it's got a great uniformed growth, nice and thick and dense, and it can be a great formal hedge. Now down here we have a plant called Kunti. This is a native Kunti, Zamia familia. I uh, used to also be called, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Zamia florindana. Um, now this is a great, great ground cover that you pretty much do nothing with. You plant it, forget about it. The two trees in this site right here are silver buttonwood, which is a coastal strand species, which, in my opinion, is a great small tree, uh, even out west. I don't like using it as a hedge out west because it tends, it tends to get a, uh, a mold problem when irrigation hits it. But as a tree, it's a, it's a great specimen. You can see the silver on the leaves here, which gives its name silver buttonwood. There's also a green variety, green buttonwood, which is another fantastic tree. Over here, we have paradise tree. This is one of the very few... Um, uh, times you see this being used in landscaping. It's starting to be used a little bit more often. Whenever you see this tree in a native environment, it has a tendency to have a really tall trunk and foliage at the very, very top. That's because it's in competition in the hammocks. When it's used as an open landscape plant, it has a wider crown or a wider uh, amount of foliage at the top. So it really can be a really nice shade tree when utilized properly. And that's why the main reason we wanted to use this here was to cool off this side of the house, create some shade underneath the area once you walk into the front yard. But a paradise tree, it's, it's a great, great tree. This right here is a pigeon plum. It's a relative of the sea grape. does not have the major 
leaf drop and um, fruit drop that sea grape has. It has some drop, and nothing compared to the sea grape. The fruit is really a, a good attractor of birds. Um, the good thing about this tree is its ability, once it's landscaped or once it's put in the ground, it has a chance to create this round canopy naturally. This tree has never been trimmed in four years since it's put in the ground. And it will keep this shape for a long period of time. Uh, when it grows in its natural environment, it has a tendency to be very leggy, and again, it's competing for light with other plants and other trees. So in this case, in this environment here, it's going to keep that round canopy head for a good number of years and probably never have to really be trimmed. It's a great small tree. All right, this plant here is Simpson Stopper. It's a great hedge for a little bit lower light. It shears up very nicely. It does not need to be sheared as much as your, your exotic hedges. Uh, it can be topped off and faced um, probably three or four times a year and stays that way. The great thing about this is the, the fragrance. Um, whenever it gets trimmed, you smell nutmeg everywhere around you. If you break off a few of the leaves and rub them on your hand, you get a real strong nutmeg smell also. So it's got a really neat fragrance. It blooms a small white flower in the spring into sometimes late summer, which attracts a number of different things, different pollinators, sometimes butterflies. Uh, the good thing about it is the red berries, after its bloom cycle is over, will attract blue jays and cardinals um, and other seed-eating birds, fruit-eating birds. And it's just a great hedge um, for using in this area. And here's one of my favorites. This is firebush. And you can see that it's covered in blooms right now. Uh, this is probably the best attractor, in my opinion, for hummingbirds, for butterflies, especially the um, zebra butterflies and the gulf fritillaries. It's just a, a fantastic hedge. What the idea here was originally is the homeowner wanted to block this window in the east. Um, it tends to get really warm in here in the morning. This is the bedroom. So what, we, what we're doing slowly but surely is slowly training this up into a hedge to block out that window completely. And it, as you can see, it grows uh, quite well in the summertime. We only need to trim this about once a year to keep it pretty much in this format. Um, and a lot of this stuff here, again, with trimming, you don't need to use any gas-powered hedge trimmers. This is all hand pruners and a pair of snips like this. It's a lot better for the material. It's healthier. It's good exercise. And um, you don't have to use all those big, loud gas equipment to maintain this, uh, this yard. My favorite hedge. Without a doubt, the best hedge in the world. This is, in my opinion, the cure-all for ficus. To get rid of that ficus hedge, you have to trim ever so often to keep it that nice manicured face look. This is Florida Privet. Forestiera, Forestiera segregata. It is the best. This thing has been trimmed maybe, I think this time, twice in this year. Um, it seems to get trimmed in the early spring, and you get that big flush of growth. You top it off once. You may top it off one more time in the summer, and that's it. And it keeps this uniform look. And as you can see, it's a, it's a dense hedge all the way down. Um, it gets a small bloom, which really doesn't seem to do much. It might get a small berry also. Um, you might get some warbler bird activity on this. When it is in, in bloom, you might get some small insects flying around, which will attract some of the warblers. Um, but as a, as a great hedge, where you have to have that hedge to hide a fence or hide a wall or do something to hide something, this is great. It just really blocks everything out, and it isn't a ficus, which needs to be trimmed continually, or orange jasmine, or anything of that nature. And it has that great manicured look. As we were talking about trying to hide a fence, the homeowners here wanted to hide an old wooden fence. That's a neighbor's fence and behind this. There used to be an old Aurelia hedge here that really just was not very eye-pleasing, I guess. And what we did here is the, the homeowners from these windows back here wanted to be able to see butterflies and hummingbirds. Now, right now, it's a little bit too late in the day to see the, uh, some of the butterflies. But as you can see, this fire